So I'm the web scientist. Uh, anybody know what web scientist is? Or shall I start there? Hands up if you know what web scientist is. Okay, I'll start there. Um, so four and a half years ago, Tim Menners Lee corralled us all into the um, Royal Society, he pointed at a 12-foot um, uh, photo of, of Isaac Newton and talked to us about the future in the web. And I was lucky enough to be part, in that, part of that room, and I, I walked into that room as an aeronautical engineer, because that's my background, but I actually walked out as a web scientist, because I understood the transformation that was underway, and I stuck up my hands and I put my company in the frame to move that forward. And one component part of that is open data, one vital component of it, almost the petroleum that powers our world. So we're, as a company, leading the, we're leading the change for private sector, public sector, the third sector, and not just in the UK, but predominantly we started our work here, to lead us to the web we want. So not perhaps the web that other people would want, companies would want, nations would want, but we as citizens want. And, and I want to share the web science vision in the context of open data to make it hopefully relevant to all of you and, and what you do in your day jobs. So a little bit about the company itself, I mean I won't take too long, but essentially, um, <coughs> stand up here. can I just move this, Julie, is that alright? Sure. So we supply all our big data platforms to HMG and um, we've just been awarded the fifth G Cloud contract and we've got a uh, frame encouragement and we've got our full open source stack on there so we're pushing ahead, plan ahead for what we can expect as citizens. And for us, um, we've always seen the value of data because we are essentially a data company. And I, I was appointed the second year to the Cabinet Office as a ministerial appointment as part of the Open Data User Group. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And that's to focus this year on the national information infrastructure. I'll explain what that is. But also to look at where the future of open data is. And the UK um, leads the world in that and continues to do it. And I'm a digital leader for the Digital Enlightenment Forum. We're a group of individuals, a network effectively that's socialising the work that we do to actually help Europe and globally, but we started predominantly in Europe, understand what the changes are in the landscape and where we might position ourselves as countries and nations. But I'll start where it all begins and where it all really ends is with some context about the web. 25 years ago this year, Tim Mendesley sat in CERN, connected two protocols and effectively said hello to the world. And that is what we call Web 1.0. It's it's a reference web. Um, at, in, back in the day, you had different like, brochure sites. If you were really posh, you had comments on it. And the conversations that I was having um, were, why, what is this web thing? Why do I need to know about it? I don't need a website. Some of you in this room probably don't even remember that. Um, and we moved on to the world that everybody's familiar with, Web 2.0, the world of relevance. Really, the Google world is the best way of explaining that. The rise of SEO, how relevant am I? Rank me, tell me who I am, find me in that way. And that obviously gave rise to a, a sweeping change, which was the era of social platforms. And, and that really is the essence of where we're talking, we're going. When you see the rise of the social platforms, I, I used to have a slide that I put them all on. I can't actually fit the social platforms on a slide anymore. So if you're thinking about um, social data and you're talking about monitoring, that's Web 2.0. I want to talk to you about what social data is for Web 3.0 in the world. And the reality is I never go into a boardroom today and somebody says, why do I need a website? I don't need a website, Jackie. They're all saying, how do I make my website more relevant? And I say to them, that's not what you need to do. Because we're moving into a new era. Web 3.0 is that new era where it's really about the power of the human connection. It's about the web we want is about how we as humans um, evolve the web to meet our needs. And the web science message that Tim members we put around the Olympic stadium, if we saw the opening ceremony, was it's for everyone. And so how do we make that web we want uh, be real for everybody? And so as organisations and as nations, communication is, is a connected communication. It's not internal, it's external, not external, it's a combination. And a website just isn't enough anymore. So, so that is 
moving our whole world on. And I'll try and describe a little bit more detail in that landscape. But this is the other thing I need to tell you. Um, there will be some people in this room that will look at this and grow, and there will be some people who go, oh, I like that. And the reality of it is, is the rise of visualisations and infographics like this are a reality for a number of reasons. And, and predominantly, it's because these new tools are being used to tell a story to an audience that doesn't know data. So how many of you in this room would consider yourself some form of data specialist? I know data. Fantastic. I'm in that room. Um, so that's not just anymore in the media. And I'll talk a little bit about how that sits. But there's a change of, there's a change of thought even in the media industry about how this whole thing sits. But this is a, this is a data visualisation, actually a visual analytics bit. Um, and it's social data for a fast moving consumer goods company that you all know the name of. And that was their ka ching moment, because they, they saw the money in it, because that's what companies tend to do. But for their CMO, it was, it was the light bulb moment. Because he was like, how can we have such a successful social media campaign? And our sales are bombed. Why is that? And you have to contextualise all of your information these days. And, and social data is one of those things. But social data in a web free world. And essentially, the story here is what happened in Twitter. Now, when you do a deep dive and you connect with the community, you can find out what happened. You can find out how to correct it too. And that was essentially enough for that very large company to change its whole philosophy about the way it used data and particularly social data. So, there's something else I need to tell you about. Um, because Generation Z are our 1993 generation. They came into the workforce in the last couple of years and, and as a Tech City mentor I see them coming in as interns in the bottom of our digital companies, which are all Generation Y. They're all largely millennial companies, the 1982 generation. They come in the bottom. They can make it to board in 10 months, not unusual. You know, we've got founders um, in Tech City who have to have their mum uh, guarantee their business deals because they're actually under 18, they're 16, 17. And the reality of it is they're actually onto something that perhaps the rest of us should be looking at. And certainly the work we do is looking into this arena. Because where Gen Y looked at the images and, the, and, and as a Gen X um, person myself, I'm, a, I'm actually a kinesthetic learner. But Gen X generally are auditory, which is why we're assembled here today and I'm talking to you, because that's a Gen X way of doing things. Gen Y, they're the visual people, which is why the infographics and visualisations are catching on and why they're so resonant. Um, but Gen Z, they're kinesthetic. So if you saw Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp, my research group that I connect with, you know, a couple of thousand millennials, a thousand Gen Zs, the, the Gen Y's view was, well, what does he think he's doing? He can't own us. He can't just buy WhatsApp and he's got us. What is that about? Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Gen Z, we're next. Because from their point of view, they actually are, are an organic force across the web. They look at things in a different way, but they actually are a kinesthetic generation. So if you've ever seen a video on YouTube called The Magazine That Doesn't Work, it's a two-year-old girl, definitely look, look it up. Um, where her mum gives her an iPad and she's happily swiping through a magazine and she takes the iPad away and gives her a magazine and she does this with it and gives it back and goes, doesn't work. For them, if we're going to engage and evolve our data landscape, we have to do the kinesthetic piece to it. We have to allow them to interact and touch. So I'm a web scientist. If you're an actor, you're told don't work with children and animals. And if you're a web scientist, don't work with an internet connection. So this is an embedded video to show you what happened when we told a story about open data that was a compelling story for different reasons. So we, there's a fabulous organisation called CIPRI who wanted to tell the story of peace across the world. So of course there's an open data specialist. What have you got? I've got arms data. Okay, not very peaceful. Um, so what we did was we contextualised that with open data about GDP across the world. And we told the story of what percentage of your GDP do you spend on arms? And therefore, by example, how peaceful are you? Not quite realising what's going to happen next. So what I'm going to show you here is what 85% of people did 
when we put this story up on The Guardian as, as one of our open data stories. And that is very unusual, but what happens is a whole groundswell of people do the same thing. So, big dog. that story which is actually posted on our free G Cloud uh, public platform was the fact that people all over the world did a very similar thing. They looked at where they expected our spending to be. Then they found other stories that we hadn't seen as data journalists. And so it was about taking that open data but making it relevant to those resonant to those people in their countries. So we had citizens in Nicaragua, in Greece, in Saudi Arabia, um, other parts of Europe, all interact with that and all take action in a very similar way. And that was when we realised actually something else is going on here. I don't know how to what that is. So the mega trends that are colliding to, to make this a, a resonance change for our web is over the next four years, web scientists and the people that are building the web we want will bring on the next 60% of humanity onto our web. That's over 5 billion more people. Now, at that same time, Generation Y will be predominant in our workforces across the world. And there's early indicators of that if you look at the global patterns. And as businesses, we will have to have transformed to, to talk in a connected way. And we're approaching a 30% penetration across the web now and English is no longer dominant. So we work in 120 languages every day. We, we localise in 16, so we can't actually use language anymore. And so for us, data and open data is our new language, and that's why it's so important. Now, I'll talk to you about the, the beginning of this story, which is, that's why I'm very accredited with co-creating the data-driven journalism industry. And I don't know how many, of, how many of you follow data journalists and see the stories that are posted. And we do. And um, we, we, we're right regarded as an industry as pioneers of open data. As Tim berners -Lee said before Christmas, is media is the one sector that gets this and <coughs> always challenges forward. And I asked him, I said to him, we've actually all got together because we're doing a reboot. Will you do the forward for me in the book? And he goes, in 30 years, I haven't done anything like that, and I won't even do it for you. But the reality of it is, this is actually driving a change to state journalism, journalism. And the reason why is to take open data back to the beginning for us. This is the first day data-driven uh, visual analytics story. Now, visual analytics, I've said that a couple of times already. That is the science behind data visualisation. So data visualisation is a set of techniques, but there's an actual human science behind it. Um, and that's what we specialise in. And this was a story that came from the WikiLeaks data that Julian Assange collected. And we elected to tell the human story of what had gone on in Afghanistan. And this is hosted on our public uh, GPR platform as well. And prior to loading this, sat with the editor of The Guardian, we were concerned that nobody would be interested. But actually this almost brought our entire cloud services down because the interest was phenomenal. Not just because it was WikiLeaks data, but because it told that human story. 
And in the first uh, two hours, we had over 34 million people interact with that. And it, it caused questions to be asked about the military strategy that was being operated and there. Uh, the reason being that those, there's over 10,000 marks on that um, visualization, but you can see there's a predominant band. What is that band? That was the insurgents understanding how the, how the military strategy operated in there, in our command and control world, and then finding the Achilles heel for it. And in the, all those dots were where civilians were being killed as a result. So the military strategy was re-examined and was changed as a result. As I'm being recorded, I'm cautious about what I'm saying about this. And that was the beginning of a two-year open data collaboration with the Guardian. I mentioned the reboot. Um, the Media Society launched an event uh, to launch the book I just showed you, where what happened um, in 2013 is the data, data journalists across our landscape here got together. And we decided we were ready for the next launch of the industry and what it would be about. So we, we wanted to write a book where we each contributed something that was a primer for our future journalists. And essentially, this book was meant to be a primer for our university courses, um, but it's ended up being something completely different. We've got four uni universities changing their PhD courses, and that was sort of the ask. But we've got two national newsrooms launching, and we're finding that open data, people that are embracing open data and looking at it for the first time, because what's happened is each data journalist has written their own chapter about what they want to pass on. We gift you this because we're moving on, we're doing something else. Actually getting started is what's happening with that book. So um, it doesn't matter to me whether you buy it or not because you're not my intended audience, but one of the things with open data that's difficult is getting started. And each of the journalists in that book, my, my chapter is about visual analytics and why the science of data is matters. But each journalist in that book has shared the things that they found the hardest thing or the most important thing that they've done with open data. And so there'll be, it, a lot of people use it as a dip-in thing, but then that's one of the things that um, I'd recommend that if you're looking to get started with open data, because there weren't many hands that were raised, then that's a great resource, albeit it wasn't really written for this audience. And, and now we've launched that book and we've got change across the industry. We will continue to drive that change and we'll continue to ensure that open data is the heart of that change because telling those stories is what's important to us. Now, open data launched in the UK in September 2009 with a closed beta and the creation of uh, what is the home of open data in the UK, data.gov.uk, and publicly launched in January 2010. But the open data agenda has evolved significantly since then. So I could have done the history piece, but then I didn't have long enough, and I decided it probably best to do today, and then where the future was. So that's what I've gone with, but I'm, I'm around for a little while afterwards if people want to, to check on any of that. So one of the first things that I want to talk about of the agenda today is it's about transparency. So why open data, what's it about, why does anybody care, why does it matter? It's about transparency. In June 2012, there was a white paper launch from Cabinet Office called Unleashing the Potential. Now, that actually came from the idea that, you know, good ideas come from everywhere and inside of government, this data is being collected for services and for purposes, but actually, what else could it do? Um, and it's a similar sort of philosophy to what, you know, what other exhaust type philosophies like social media data. And there's all sorts of issues with that as there is with open data. But essentially, it's understanding that this data connects us and connects our world. But government isn't the only harm of this. And across, basically what happened was about eight of us in cabinet office um, got together, we got a big whiteboard, we drew lots of things on the whiteboard, and what happened is um, the G8 went to Washington in June 2012 to a summit. That's, that's what happened. So the white paper, the Washington summit, and then to skip through everything that happens, which is um, very exciting if you're in that world, what happened was the formation of something called the Open Government Partnership. That is definitely something you should look at. The, the UK chaired that from April 2012, co-chaired it with Brazil. And essentially in October 2013, so we go from June 2012, Washington Summit, to the Not exactly ecstatic about doing it, but there. 
And then we, we scooted round to October 2013, we had 61 nations come to Westminster. Those nations actually, they cover over a third of the world's population. So we go from the G8, who signed a commitment to do the stuff, and then we go to 61 nations. And that is in no time whatsoever. Now, everything I've told you about the web is why. But equally, that is something that's going on around us, part of all of our citizenship. Where we are now is, from the original eight, we've now got 64 nations. We've actually, you know, got nations that originally said, I don't get this, I don't see why. I'm not going to name them because I'm on camera. But each of the nations are part of the Open Government Partnerships of the 64. They're working towards what they call a national action plan. So from a UK-centric point of view, I know possibly lots of people are global businesses, and, but the UK leads the world in this and is going to continue to do so. So looking at the UK action plan and what's going on here actually is the key because it li we're largely trailblazing here. And obviously we've got the rest of the G7 working with us on that. But what's going on here is a good signal for what's going on everywhere if you're going to start to get involved in doing the data agenda. So here it is, data.gov. UK. This is the homepage as of yesterday. Um, and this is, I mentioned I'd taken a second year appointment as, um, uh, to the Open Data Use Group, but one of my roles in the first year was to work with the data.gov UK team to actually evolve this site into understanding how do you, how do you open up this agenda? And, and from the Minister said last week, Understanding what people need, because at the time we had 8,000 data sets up there, but it was largely not being used. 40 consistent users and a lot of sporadic ones, and we didn't know why. Um, and that has completely changed with the work that ODA did in the first year. So I'll cover the, the, the open data that we have in the UK. This, is, this will translate elsewhere. We've defined it in a different way, we contextualise it a different way, but if you look at it in the UK, you can pretty much skip around the world to any territory that you're interested in. So there's two types of open data. Supply-led, possibly if you're familiar with open data, this is the piece that you know. And um, this is where government departments, since the unleashing of potential white paper, have been had the ask of, release us your data, we will find a second use for it. And one of the things that happened when I started with ODA was there was, there was these urban myths about why data wasn't used. And I'm, I, you know, I'm a web scientist, I don't work with this, I have to work with evidence. So I set about working out how to get evidence about why it wasn't used. And the other myths were, there's a quality barrier. Some of this data that's up there, this open data that's up there, it's all in bits and pieces, it, the quality's not, the format's not the same. The sorts of things that we as MGM specialists would go, well it all needs to be consistent and that's why. Not true, that's the open myth, that wasn't actually true. And I'll talk about what the real barriers were later. So this is, if you go onto data.gov, you press the data button, this is what you get. And essentially, it's a huge set of lists. So as of yesterday, there were 17,519 data sets on data.gov. So we're not short of open data. There's lots of it. And we've got, what we've done as a result of the Open Government Partnership last year is we've looked at what we know we've published, but what we also know we haven't published. That's not to say we will publish that data that's not published, because it may, there may be good reasons why it's not published, but we'll declare that we have it. So trying to understand the whole data -like landscape that sits within government. And as at now, we have 232 what we call national information infrastructure data sets. And that's the work that ODUG is, is working on this year um, to actually explore that, contextualise that, make that more relevant to people. And what we have, if you, you know, it's, obviously that's masses of open data, where do you even start? What we did was, when we, I'll talk about the, the form of open data we created to create the evidence for this agenda, but there are themes, you've just seen them on the edge of the screen, there are themes here. Depending on your context, you can choose a theme and actually explore that theme. So we've tried to make the data available based on who owns it, where it comes from, and actually what you might use it for. And it is an explore piece to start. But this contextualised <coughs> piece will probably help you. 
Because we created a new form of open data called demand layer open data. And, and I worked with the data.gov.uk team to change data.gov to, to build in an extra component to understand what people needed. And the, again, that's hosted on the uh, public GCloud platform that Flying Binary have. And one of the things that happened was, as a result of that, we collected evidence. We all went out to our <coughs> communities. There are 12 of us, 16 of us now, um, data use group. We all went out to our commun communities, and in every presentation we did, we seeded the message, what do you need? It's not being used, what do you need? The, the, what came back was a grand swell. Um, this is the thing that most people know when they talk about it. This is the open data request roadmap. This is what people have asked for. We have um, over, well, approaching 9,000 people interacted with this, explored this, understood it. And for everybody that does that, 10% of those people actually evidence what they need from open data. So we now have, from the original 40 citizens that were regularly consuming on data.com, we now have approaching 9,000 people who are actively involved with it and then 10% go on to request data and get volunteer involved with the agenda. And the thing about this is there's a button here. You can see the progress we've got, not as fast as you'd like. If you saw my blog at data.gov last week, you'll see one. Um, request new data. If there's something that's not here that you need, press that button and you can get it. And then you can actually, we made our open data evidence open, because you would and you can actually get this data as well. So the whole thing about this is trying to understand why people use it and what they do. And for me, always, it's evidence-led. So the other myth, it's about the quality. It's not about the quality. The reason people don't use it are, there's lots of reasons, but there's three key ones that come through. The licensing, depending on who owns this data, who the data holder is of this data, who in government is their data. Um, they license it. Those licenses are often not open government license. They often don't allow you to do a Creative Commons downstream, you can do anything with it type licensing. A huge barrier. And we've done 18 business cases, some you know, a large proportion of those have been around the licensing models that, that government has, which is all part of the transition from you know, unleashing the potential of open data when that's not what you did. If you supply a you just put it out to your departmental agendas as opposed to prioritising it to what people need. And um, cost. Some of our most important data sets, the ones that are in our national information infrastructure, are paid for. Now, you know, I'm a tech city manager, I've already said that. Lots of our companies believe data is the foundation of what they do. They are not going to pay five figure sums to get access to some of our most important data sets. They do other things, but they won't do that because it's just not economic for them. And even though there's been some flex in some of the licensing models, it's not a licensing model you can depend on. It's not a cost you can depend on. A one-off change to allow companies to do this for a year. You know, our digital companies want to be able to build a business on, around it. The core of what they do is data. And then the unreliability. Now that covers a multitude of sins, but what we've, the messages we've got to the departments are, if you're going to publish it, and you'd love to publish it every week, fantastic, but actually you can realistically give us a really good, dependable one every quarter, do every quarter. Because actually what we need is to rely when the refresh happens, not to have, you know, the excitement of being able to publish it as soon as you got it, but then I couldn't do it this Wednesday because John's off on holiday. So actually commit to a publication timetable that we can depend on. Now that's work that's going out from a transparency team point of view across the, the departments at the moment and we're working on it. Interestingly though, because I, I lead so, on Open Data for ODUG on several departments, what we've, what we've done in conjunction with the transparency teams in the departments is We've actually used this mechanism to prioritise data releases. So we know what think people are using it for. We know why they need it, because they tell us when they ask for it. Then what we've done is we've said, actually, we know the people are waiting for this. So let's move that one up the agenda, because for the department, there's five things to do. 
Actually, if one's more important because people are waiting on it, and others are part of the department's agenda where we don't know anybody needs it, let's use that as a priority. Because government, like everywhere else, is, is resource strapped and cash strapped and everything else. And therefore, it's actually allowed us to focus in the departments on the priorities for the agenda. Um, and that's you all as citizens, or certainly citizens out there, um, helping us do that change. And it's been an amazing uh, piece. So there's a number of other initiatives going on from a next steps point of view, and I just want to do this quickly. Um, but they and they're ones that we're working on as a company, but they're they're key to the open data agenda, and and it may resonate with you and your work. Just kicked off or will on July the first a new local open data as part of um, a move to understand how we can we can bring a national picture to a local focus. And that, that's been funded by the Public Sector Transparency Board to allow us to evidence how that will work, but actually release some open data at the same time. So you'll hear more about that one. Smart Cities, I'm a, an independent smart city lead. I've worked with eight international cities um, as a big data citizen enablement piece over the last couple of years. And I'm an independent advisor for some of our UK cities. I'm also, um, I've also helped create the British Standard, which we launched this summer for um, smart cities and the data interoperability. So that's something to look forward to. Um, and the word, we've just done our closed review of it, and um, it's looking good. And the, the thing you need to look out for there is something from the BSI, British Standards Institute, called PAS 182. And it talks about how smart <coughs> cities will use data interoperability. interoperability. <coughs> Now, citizen enablement, that's the future as far as we're concerned because the future of the web depends on this. And, and our, our journey started with the data journalism industry and open data. And we've got some really exciting announcements to come at the back end of this year on the next piece on that, so look out for that. But really, I'm here today to say, what about you? Because you're domain specialists in whatever you do as a day job. And there's quite a few of you data specialists, and there's a lot of work to be done. You know, this is a big agenda that could cross many sectors, and it crosses, it's crossing the world, as I've explained. But it's, it's also, with our clients, adding real value um, to organisations. But it's sometimes difficult to know where to start. You know, 17,000 data search checking, wow, you're overwhelmed already. So I thought about how that might work for you, and where you might want to start exploring. <coughs> On data.gov, behind the data in the UK, um, there are these case studies. Now, this is the one for the roadmap that I've already shown you. So, we've got context of the roadmap and what we did with open data. And then this is the, the use group. We've got 50 of these loaded. We're loading more all the time. So, if you go on to data.gov and look for case studies, it tells you what we did with it. And lots of people are using these as inspiration for what they might do with open data. Um, either at an organisational level, or if you, if you uh, have time to read the roadmap, individuals are, uh, are the main consumers of open data um, in the UK, so it might be a personal journey for you. And I mentioned the themes before, uh, there, are, there are 10 in total which emerged from, um, from the work we did in OJIG last year, transport, society, economy, mapping, spending, there's a whole list of them. And they're another idea of where I suggest you start in getting involved with the open data agenda. Um, and if you're a data journalist and you use the mapping theme, what might you do? That's what I did. Um, so I contextualise the education provision in a local authority context. There's some policy changes taking place in education, and these are all the provision of services in an educational context within a local authority. And that actually has helped us understand the impact of those policy changes at a national level, which just happens through the southwest. I just like coasts, so I did that one. But we've got a UK version, it's just, I just blew it up so that you can see. And all of those um, individual marks contextualise a particular sort of provision. So the educational policy specialists plug and play with this map to understand what they're, what they're impacting and where their, their work is and what else they might do. So, what might you do? I'm hoping there's some stories coming out of this room and that's the reason I came today. Thank you, and I'll take questions.
Thank you. Um, you talk into you introduced it with the web, um, bringing the two together, web and data, linked data. Mm -hmm. That's uh, one of Tim Berners-Lee's vision, and that's a way of delivering open data. How mm -hmm. do you see that evolving? I think that it will evolve, um, and that's why people talked about quality as being the urban myth barrier. We're not at that space. So that work's going on. It will continue to go on. The semantic web is, is not dead by any means. However, we have a meantime situation to, because the essence of the world we work in, with, the web that, that's being built and the, the um, onboarding of people to it, is an agenda that's accelerating. In the meantime, how do we create capability and capacity? The reality of it is, if we can start with CSV formats, JSON formats for the rest of us, we can actually shift this forward. There's nothing that stops those two things connecting. So the, you know, we're heavily involved in that linked data world. But the reality of it is most people don't see it that way. And if you're going to bring open data into your organisation, that doesn't contextualise well. So that work is all going on. That's one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing. But from a point of view of how data specialists might get involved in this agenda and what open data might mean to you, um, I've talked about it in the way I have. But it's a good question. If you're fascinated by linked data, there's a load of work going on, but I can't cover it today. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. Questions? Yeah, just a quick question about quality. Um, I did some work with a big mobile company mm -hmm. who started to access small data sources with the help of the ODI. Mm -hmm. We're talking next. Yep. Um, the biggest problem they got was actually a quality problem, mm -hmm. uh, which was not so much to do with the inherent quality of the, of the data itself, it was the lack of metadata. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't understand what these data sets were referred to what they meant. <coughs> What's going on in that space? So that's what the national information infrastructure is really trying to address, because the metadata is the key to that. And whether we, where, you know, where, where we end up in the argument, where, we're in the midst of that now. But if we can contextualise that argument with the national information infrastructure data sets, we can look at them in that way. Because if, if they are, I shouldn't really use this word, but the core of it, i.e. we get these right, they set the precedent for it all. So I, I would say that I would completely agree with you. Um, with our big data stacks, when we use open data in it, we actually have a profile process where we use a, an open source ETL layer to actually rationalise all of that. So, so we have a tech solution to that because it's very real. Um, and for us, we, that's a plug and play uh, capability. So for us, we can switch it on and off, but obviously that's because we do what we do. But you're right, the metadata is an issue and the national information infrastructure. I would hope we would get to uh, data sets that you could not only rely on and all the rest of it, but we'd have SLAs against and, and all of that, where all the things would be in place, because I really do believe the data is that important, but it's a matter of mo moving the agenda from where it is to that next layer, and that's what the National Information Infrastructure is about. And, and uh, the, the thing that I, I mentioned earlier was local data. That's actually going to do that for three key data sets in the local agenda. So again, if we learn we may learn something, we've already learned something from doing that initial technical work on the local agenda. So, but it's a good question and stay with us, really. A quick question for me, one of the things I think is interesting, I'm always interested about the, <coughs> the people side of data. Um, what, what you mentioned there was about the fact that it's not a technology problem, really. It's much more a problem. Yes, there are some technology issues to, to address there. Mm -hmm. What's your view of the balance between where the effort needs to be is around people versus technology? I really don't believe it's a technology problem. I mean, we've been working on this agenda um, publicly for three plus years and been doing what we do all over the world. And so we've got tech that does it. And so tech's the least of our problems. It's about building capacity, which only people can help you do. The web we want is a citizen enablement piece. How do we all contribute to that web we want? How do we keep that web open and free such that we can be having these debates and we can move in the agenda forward? It's people. So the 34 million audience that we have as a result of the work we do, we have 3,000 of them we can call on any time day or night if we need some help. And that's essentially those connected networks are those people then reach out across the world. So it is, as we've moved into Web 3.0 and it's a resonant world, it is actually about the people. So there are some, there's a philosophy that says 
Um, oh, now, now's time for AI and it's not about the human. I, I would disagree with that fundamentally. It is very much about the human. And anybody in this room who's already a data specialist, it's about you particularly. But it's also about us all spreading the word that when language no longer works, you know, when 80% when of the world is online and language isn't, data will be the language. It might not be the only language, but it will be our language of choice in order to be able to communicate. So fundamentally, that's people that will, that will make that happen because the tech's done, really. Yeah, my point of view it is. Hi. Hello. Hi, Jackie. It was a great talk. Um, just a question on the roadmap, and you mentioned that there's over 700 requests being put up there. Um, could you give us a flavour of the ones that are really popular or the ones that people are most <coughs> wanting open at the moment? Um, well, the National Information Infrastructure <coughs> data sets, they, they're heavily represented. We've done 18 business cases so far. It's no secret that ODUG have campaigned relentlessly on addressing. We have to have an open address data set. We have to have it. Location is the only thing that matters. I know you're going to say that, but it is the only thing that matters. Everything is contextualised with it. It needs to be at a very granular level, the whole basis of it. But obviously, from a cabinet office point of view, we're moving the whole agenda forward, and that's not the only thing. But as a technologist, I have to have it. Um, and then the other things are that you will see what we funded recently. We funded some of the smart city pieces because smart city is very important. But how do we know what we need for open data? Well, we're going to try it, and we are trying it. So open data, ODUG has funded some of those. And then the other one is the local uh, agenda that I spoke about because this, this everything I talked about today is all from the the bundles of, of data requests we've had. So what we've done is we've prioritised all of our work and everything is demand-led. And the Minister said um, last week, that's the key, because we know we're delivering something that people want. We can obviously evolve what we deliver, but we're actually tackling it from a needs basis because people are going to do stuff with this. So I think as you see ODUG um, doing its business cases, its new initiatives, and I mean we talked about the, the local one last week, didn't we? That's actually a signal that those are the, the, the key sets of demand requests that are coming in, because everything's driven by that. We don't do anything else. Question about that. You mentioned that there are currently 64 nations working together on Data. Is there an organization or a website where you can actually follow what's going on? Yes. So the Open Government Partnership, yes. um, which is currently chaired with FI Indonesia. So if you if you literally Google Open Government Partnership, that's right. the website. Okay. And that would that is where all of the strategic vision for OGP um, is done. And um, you can look at it in your context, Peter, or your context wherever that might be. So you're, if, you're, if any territory you're looking at is an OGP um, member, there is open data work going on there. So of those 64, and the open data work is largely driven from the transparency agenda. If we connect the world from a nation level, then we can understand transparently what's going on and make some changes to that world. So, you know, there's, there's a, it, it's obviously not across the world yet, it's only just over a third of the world's population, but, you know, there are very connected communities that are there as well, and there's an open data capability and capacity being built or already there in that nation, in each of those 64 nations. But the action plans, yes. they're the key, because that actually signals the future. So OGP will talk about, the website will talk when an action plan is loaded, and if you're interested in a particular territory, go to the action plan and then drive it from there. So that's how to track it all. And then, you know, there's strategic meetings, policy changes. There's a whole host of things going on. But open government partnerships where you need to look for that as the global agenda. Okay. I've got one more quick question for the break. No? Oh, uh, just make an observation. Mm -hmm. uh, from running workshops for small businesses in open mm -hmm. data, um, the barriers to adoption, have, I've found, have been technical skills or um, within the smaller organisations. And secondly, just a lack of knowledge. I mean, for example, people don't realise they can open CSV files with Excel, and they don't actually need sophisticated tools. So 
sinking around. That is why yeah. we wrote this book. <laughs> yeah. Because I have yeah. to, my fellow data journalists would say that's all very well. I mean, I work with 3,000 companies in Tech City. Yeah. I hear that too. Yeah. But they have no budgets, they have no time. I would get a phone call at two o'clock, I would need to load a story an hour and a half later with a data set I'd never heard of before. And so no excuses, no regrets is what we would say as data journalists. And we wrote this book because that is what people kept saying to us. It's like, no, not correct. Every single one of us, John Mayer who actually edited this, who's a force to be reckoned with in the editorial world of journalism. You think life's tough as an SME? Try being an journalist. He actually put us on point. You know, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing the other. No more excuses in the book. Now let's all move on as data journalists because, and that's honestly why we wrote that book. Every the tools, the techniques, where we start, what we do, how we do it, what we found, all the things we didn't need are not in the book. All the things we do every day are in the book. It's not a book promotion. But, but if, if one of my SMEs dares to say that to me, I go, on my website, I'll get you the editorial copy without the margin, if you like, but don't come to me for training, because it's in here. Now, that's just the start of your journey, but actually making a start, you learn so much. It is a discovery process, but my data scientists, they love that. So people who love data love that discovery, but that is genuinely why we wrote this. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you. Exactly. Okay.